Today we'll be going over integration by parts using a technique called the DI method. The purpose of the DI method is to simplify an integral by breaking it up into two parts, namely the part that will be differentiated and the part that will be integrated. It is a much faster and more efficient method than the traditional method. I should note that both the traditional method and the DI method of integration by parts will produce the same answer. It's really just a matter of how much time you want to spend on the problem. So, first you want to choose the function that, when differentiated, is made simpler. Next, you're going to choose the function that can be integrated. And in this way, you'll have set up the D and the I aspects of the DI method. Let's go ahead and take an example now. First, we need to choose a function to be differentiated and integrated. In this example, we should differentiate x squared since it will eventually be reduced to a constant which means that we will have to integrate e up to the x. We then perform each of the calculations in a grid so that we can keep track of our work. We want to write out as many terms as we can until we reach a point where one of the terms is equal to 1 or 0. Notice that to the left of each row, there's an alternating pattern of plus and minus signs. These are important since they'll tell us the signs of our final answer. Next, we draw horizontal lines, which I've highlighted in blue here, to show that these functions will be multiplied by each other, with each of the signs attached to the first term. Our last step is to draw a horizontal line, which I've highlighted in orange, which will correspond to the terms that will be integrated. Here's what our solution will look like once we've plugged in all of our work. We have that the integral of x squared times e up to the x is equal to x squared e up to the x plus negative 2x times e up to the x, plus 2 times e up to the x, minus the integral of 0 times e up to the x dx. Since the integral of 0 is just a constant, we're left with x squared times e up to the x, minus 2x e up to the x, plus 2 times e up to the x, plus c. Why don't we go ahead and try a different example now? Suppose we're given the function x times sine x dx. We want to go ahead and choose a function that's, that is to be differentiated, and one that's going to be integrated. In this case, it seems, it seems like the best option to go ahead and choose x as the function to be differentiated, uh, simply because we know that once we differentiate it enough, x is going to uh, turn to a constant, which is what we want. So we'll go ahead and integrate sine x, and we'll keep track of each of the signs within each of the uh, integrations, because when you take the integral of sine x, what you get is negative cosine x. So we'll go ahead and stop once we hit the zero point, and then we'll draw our arrows accordingly. Next, we're going to go ahead and lay out the equation as it's going to be seen in our calculation. So what we have is that the integral of x squared times e up to the x dx is equal to x times negative cosine x minus 1 times negative sine x plus the integral of 0 times negative sine x dx. Again, we see that the integral of 0 is just going to be a constant, and what we should be left with altogether is negative x cosine x plus sine x plus c. To give you one last example, I want to go ahead and consider this function right here. It's the integral of e up to the x times sine x dx. Now, when you're choosing which, in, which of the terms to differentiate and which to integrate, it's important to keep in mind that in some cases it won't necessarily matter which ones you choose since both of these functions have integrals and derivatives that bring the function back to what it originally was eventually, it's not extremely necessary that we choose which one is to be differentiated and which one is to be integrated. For simplicity's sake, I've chosen to differentiate e up to the x, and I'm going to integrate sine of the x. So we'll go ahead and perform the calculations until we reach a certain point. And it's at this point right here that we want to stop, uh, primarily because if we go any further, what we're going to end up doing is see that um, each of these terms just continues to repeat infinitely, and we'll never get to a point where we can, where any of the two terms are going to give us that one or zero value that we're looking for. But this is an important place because we've also noticed that there's a pattern here, that eventually we reach the function of e up to the x times sine, negative sine of x, excuse me. This is important because when we set up the integral, we can actually see some patterns here, and we'll be able to evaluate the integral using another sort of technique, 
that may not come to mind at first, but is going to help us to find the actual value of this integral. So we'll go ahead and begin by plotting our integral of e up to the x times sine x dx. And what we'll get is e up to the x times negative cosine x minus e up to the x times negative sine x plus the integral of e up to the x minus sine x dx. So what we want to do is we want to move that negative sign on the sine x inside of the integral to the outside of the integral. And what we will be left with is going to be that the integral of e up to the x times sine x dx is equal to e up to the x times negative cosine x minus e up to the x uh, times negative sine x plus the integral of e up to the x times negative sine x dx. Now, what we see here is that if we move that negative sign out of the integral, what we should be left with is our same function, but now we notice that there's a negative integral on the right side of the equation and a positive integral on the left side of the equation. Since the integrals equal to each other, what we can do is we can simply add the integral onto both sides of the equation. What will end up happening is we can cancel out the integral on the right side and we'll be left with 2 times the integral on the left side, or 2 times the integral of e up to the x times sine x dx is equal to e up to the x times negative cosine x minus e up to the x times negative sine x. What we can do at this point is we can multiply both sides of the equation by 1 half, and what we'll get is our answer. What we're left with is e up to the x times sine x dx is equal to negative 1 half e up to the x cosine x plus 1 half e up to the x sine of x plus c. Now, just to recap, the first step is to choose the appropriate functions to be differentiated and integrated. As we've seen, it usually is helpful to choose the function that is going to produce a constant to be differentiated. And we always want to choose a function that, can, that actually can be uh, integrated, otherwise we'll end up in the same, with the same issue that we had initially, uh, which is uh, we'll end up with an integral that just can't be integrated as it is. Step two is we stop when either one of these two situations occur. The first one is when one of the functions equals zero or one, as we've seen, or in, the, in this case, uh, as we saw in the previous problem, we'll stop when there's a repeating pattern. Step three is to simply evaluate the integral. I hope that was helpful.